everybody, welcome back to Let's Go Geo as usual. I am your field guide, Heather, and today we get a beach day, more specifically, lakeside. <laughs> That is Mono Lake. Mono Lake is a rather large lake sitting in the Mono Basin, but one thing to note is that it's not as big as it used to be. You see, in 1941, Los Angeles DWP began diverting water from the tributary streams that fed Mono Lake. This, of course, had pretty drastic consequences on the lake. Over the next 40 years, it caused it to drop by 45 vertical feet. It lost half of its volume. It doubled in salinity. And these factors obviously had bad consequences on the surrounding ecological systems. It was terrible for migratory and nesting birds, including the California gull, which suffered immensely from these changes. Air quality was greatly diminished. It led to toxic dust storms in the area. All of this changed the lake forever. It ended up setting a management required level at which to keep the lake, and that level is 6,392 feet. As you can see, this is very different from the historical levels. Take a look at this graph. You can see the historical level before diversions and that decreasing of the lake volume over time. This shows where the lake level would have been, likely, had it not been diverted. And this shows where the lake has been, including what you can see is it's failed to really meet that desired management level. This is why. The lake level is dependent on about four primary factors, two of which have to do with water input into the lake. The first one is the Sierra Nevada snowfall. The other factor that goes in to the lake level is the Great Basin precipitation levels. And those precipitation levels have also been low. This area is and has been in a drought for some time. Now let's talk about the other factors that influence the lake level. You can actually see those bathtub rings, the things that show us where the lake level once was. The lake level is also obviously much lower because of something we've already talked about, and that's those diversions. And the other outflow factor that matters is evaporation. Now because of these abnormally low lake levels, one interesting thing has shown up, and that is these peculiar, tower-like structures around the lake. And what we're talking about is tufa. Those strange structures along the lake shore back there, well, that's it, that's tufa. Tufa, similar to marine carbonates like limestone, are made up of calcium carbonate. Once the waters are enriched with the carbonate, then they can deposit. And all those water diversions have reduced lake levels such that the tufa, as you can see, are now exposed, making them vulnerable and inhibiting growth as they are above lake level now. Mono Lake and its tufa are also really important habitat sites for a number of species, for the California gulls and migratory birds, as nesting sites for owls and osprey. These serve as underwater habitat to the alkali flies. Mono Crater's volcanic field consists of vents in Mono Lake and on its north shore. The most recent activity in the Long Valley to Mono Lake region took place only about 300 years ago. One more strange fact about Mono Lake, during the Cold War era, this area was actually used for top secret seismic tests. And in the 80s, researchers accidentally discovered radioactive anomalies in the lake that they concluded might have been due to the disposal into the lake of radioactive material. Even the Navy testing underwater nuclear bombs in the 50s. And this practice may have been suspended due to the newly built munitions depot located near Hawthorne, Nevada at the southern portion of Walker Lake, which we'll be exploring next. We are continuing to explore the geological and geographically interesting lake you see behind me. And you might be thinking, Heather, how interesting can a lake possibly get? But just remember our recent discussions of local lakes, from toxic dust storms to lake bombings and tufa towers. And today's lake also has some peculiar surprises, so let's take a look. Walker Lake is a natural terminal lake located in a geographic low, or basin, in the basin and range of western Nevada. It is the terminus point of the Walker River Basin, which encompasses a little over 4,000 square miles. This lake is in trouble. The lake level is painfully low. Walker Lake's volume has decreased by more than 90 percent, 
and in about the last hundred years, its surface area has decreased by more than half. Walker Lake used to be half the surface area of Lake Tahoe. Now, it's maybe a quarter. As a result, in the last approximately 100 years, the lake level is now this far from the sign. If I were to say, fill up a cup and gulp it, I'm not gonna do that. This water has high total dissolved solids, and I mean really high. 17,000 milligrams per liter. That's a lethal dose for fish. Total dissolved solids include the sum of, well, all dissolved solids. This includes stuff like salt ions, but also other minerals and metals and pollutants. And that brings us to the story of the loons. Walker Lake was once considered one of the largest migratory stopovers for loons west of the Mississippi. But a consequence of those high dissolved solids and impurities in the water, like I mentioned, a lethal level for fish was particularly harmful for eggs and small fish, which happened to be the food choice for the loons. So why is Walker Lake level so low? Well, this is a similar story to a lot of the other lakes that we've talked about in the Great Basin. And that is, it's a combination of those historical geological instances, as well as human-caused factors. Walker Lake is a pluvial lake, a leftover from the Pleistocene from ancient Lake Lahontan. However, many of the lakes held on through the Younger Dryas to about 14 to 10,000 years ago, at which point the lake started to dry up in response to the changing climate. Unsurprisingly, Lakes and enclosed basins, like many of the remnants of Lake Lahontan that are now receiving low rainfall and experiencing high evaporation, will continue to shrink. But this is more of a long-term trend. It doesn't account for that puny lake we see today. So what is going on? As much as we'd love to blame aliens, it's not. It's humans. Agricultural diversions from the Walker River that feeds the lake have been so dramatic that they've practically taken all the water that would otherwise feed into the lake. Hmm. Am I forgetting anything else interesting about the lake? Oh yes, the mysterious and forbidden south side of the lake. Signs like this remind us that we're not even technically allowed to go to the south side of the lake. And even if we tried, we might be exposed to unexploded munitions, algal blooms, dissolved solids, the chance of a bomb. Maybe that's why I'm not seeing many people around here. And today we are in Eastern California where a once gorgeous blue lake suddenly went dry. Today we have to say its name a little different, Owens Dry Lake. This is the Owens River. It headwaters north of here, north of Mammoth, east of Yosemite, from the Sierra Nevada mountains. From there, it flows down through the Owens Valley, gathering water from the adjacent mountain streams and continues to flow all the way down to its terminus, filling Lake Owens. At least, it did. In the 1800s, the quiet Owens Valley was actually quite the happening place. With the California mining boom and new railroads set, the mountains on each side of the valley were soon pitted like Swiss cheese with mining prospects. One of the largest of these mining operations was the Cerro Gordo mine located on the east side of the lake in those mountains. This was a silver and lead and zinc mine primarily. Ore was hauled by mule down the mountain. And over there on the east side of the lake near a place called Swansea was the smelter to turn that rough ore into those shiny buoyants. The smelter ran on charcoal. The large valley you see behind me in those mountains is the cottonwood drainage, and it's on the west side of the lake, but it's actually the source of the wood for the mines. The wood was burned in these charcoal kilns, and then the charcoal was shipped across the lake to feed the smelter. Yeah, you heard me right. I said shipped across the lake, an image that serves as a testament to the lake's grand size in the 1800s. In fact, this town of Cartago was known as a bustling port city where supplies like food, liquor, grain, and machinery was swapped for cargo from the mines on large barge-like vessels. Now keep in mind that during this time, there were a lot of major changes going on. The U.S. acquired land that now includes California and our little village with a big name in 1850. Also, the western mining boom was in full speed. 
Our little village grew into one of the largest U.S. metros. You know it today as Los Angeles. Meanwhile, in 1877, a man stepped ashore at El Pueblo de Los Angeles. His name was William Maholland, initially serving as the San Jero and later the head of various water organizations for the city. He would change the face of L.A. forever, and not just L.A. This ditch gathers water from the adjacent mountains destined for Owens Lake. But if we follow this ditch of water, we'll see it actually flows, that's right, all the way down to LA. Maholland and some others in what's been labeled as socio-political chicanery began buying up land hundreds of miles from LA here in the Owens Valley, and lots of it. They also bought up a bunch of land around San Fernando Valley, giving them the dubious title of the San Fernando Syndicate. Finds like this can be found all over the valley, and it's proof of LA's footprint here. Construction began in 1908 and involved a massive infrastructure project. By 1913, the first of these waters flowed on down to LA, but not without a fight. Locals protested by dynamiting parts of it and opening up Sluice Gate. And remember the San Fernando Syndicate? Well, this included Maholland along with Fred Eaton, the mayor, Harrison Otis, a LA Times publisher, and Henry Huntington, a railroad executive. And it turns out that if we look at where the LA aqueduct ran through, the San Fernando Valley grew tremendously due to the aqueduct. And these guys have been accused of knowing that this would be the case, hence the reason why they bought up all the land there. They built the St. Francis Dam around 1926. Meanwhile, at Owens Lake, trouble ensued. By 1926, the lake was declared dry. People at Cerro Gordo once proclaimed ducks were by the square mile millions of them. When they rose in flight, the roar of their wings could be heard on the mountaintop at Cerro Gordo, 10 miles away. Looking at the otherworldly dry lake bed that it is today, it can be hard to imagine that it actually was once that beautiful blue lake only about a century ago. But the evidence abounds. From the tales of the steamships hauling ore to the thunderous sound of the flapping of duck wings and a thunderous sound below foot. In 1872, a large earthquake struck the Owens Valley, leaving behind scarps or ridges of visible land displacement. There are also some other lines around the lake, sort of circular ones. Those are bathtub rings or markers of historic lake levels. What's interesting about these bathtub rings though is that they don't appear to be impacted by the earthquake or cut by a scar. There's no displacement in them. Hmm. So that means that these rings must have been deposited after the 1872 earthquake and of course sometime before the 1913 siphoning. Only two years after the lake was declared dry, the St. Francis Dam cataclysmically failed in 1928, serving as one of the largest man-made flood disasters in U.S. history, killing 431 people. When the lake dried up, soda operations changed drastically. In the 30s and 40s, the Mono Basin Extension, a series of diversions of streams that were destined for Mono Lake, ensued. And another major aqueduct was built, the Colorado River Aqueduct, donning a new age of dams and diversions that would forever change the Colorado River and the American Southwest. And by around the 70s, two more major aqueducts would be constructed. There's the California State Aqueduct, which brings water down from the north, and yet another second LA aqueduct to bring water from the east, from the Owens Valley, once again. By now, you're probably surprised that there's any liquid left in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Well, both poor water management and the exacerbating effects of a changing climate, both regionally and globally, certainly aren't helping. Speaking of air quality, one of the worst results of a dry Lake Owens was the dust, toxic dust. For decades, alkali dust laced with heavy metals showered the area some 30 miles in all directions, especially when the winds kicked up, which is often here. But there's more. Aerial images or even a good close-up at times depicts a red tinge on the lake. What causes this red tinge? Well, it's a result of halobacteria, and despite the name, they're actually archaea. These halophiles, or salt-loving organisms, are what's responsible for turning the salt pink. They're also what's responsible for causing severe respiratory issues. Giving it the infamous award of being quite possibly the single largest source of PM10 emissions in the U.S.
a result of all of this, authorities must now, ironically, add water to the lake in order to keep down the dust. And as we plunge into a future of a troubled Colorado River in American Southwest, a shrinking Great Salt Lake, of which many fear might go the way of Owens, as well as a unstable climate outlook and more water woes, possibly water wars, the Owens Lake story serves as a great tale, maybe even an eerie foreshadow of what can happen when humans alter natural hydrologic systems.